Hi, I'm Don Moores and welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. The Maryland General Assembly is back in operation for the 2014 session, a three month marathon that is now underway. Barbara Henry, Managing Director of the Committee for Montgomery, is here to bring us up to date on what's happening and how the Committee for Montgomery is responding to issues that are important to Montgomery County. U.S. Asia Links LLC was started with a motto, bringing our planet's businesses and technologies together to build a better world. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Xu Ping Chan, one of the co-founders of the company, is here to tell us all about this new business. Video games, kids love them. Uh, learning to build their own games is a great way to teach them programming as well as to keep them engaged in school. Aaron Overton is here to give us yes. details from his experience as a teacher at Wheaton High School. The Beacon has something new, a mobile app that will reach your mobile device. Stuart Rosenthal, editor and publisher of The Beacon, is here to tell us all about it as well as some health stories. But I have to tell you, I think most of his viewership or most of his readers still want to hold a newspaper in their hands. <laughs> Barbara, welcome back. It's great to see Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. So we're just a couple weeks into the session or week into the session now. Um, you know, I come back to this question I have to answer periodically among my friends. We care about Congress. We care about the County Council, but somehow Annapolis seems distant from us. Is that something that's not very good for Montgomery County residents to, to feel that way? I think it's not very good for Montgomery County residents to feel that way. I think people don't understand how much money we send to the state of Maryland and how little we get back. Right. And I think you're going to watch that play out in particular this session. Mm -hmm. The county has requested an enormous amount of money in school construction funding. And uh, last year we helped other areas of the state go after school construction funding and the question, the big question for us is, will they help us now? Mm -hmm. The request stands about $750 million. It's a big right. number. Well, we've got more kids. We're the biggest, we're the economic engine of the state. Is it difficult, I guess, for committee for Montgomery and for the legislature, for the legislature, uh, the, the delegation from Montgomery County to convince the state that our needs are as great as, as, as the needs elsewhere, Baltimore City, Prince George's, Eastern, Western Maryland? Well, I think there's a misconception about what Montgomery County looks like in 2014. I think, you know, people hold on to what they believed at a certain time, and it's very difficult to convince them that things have changed. And things have changed radically in, in Montgomery County and will continue to change, not least of which is we our, popul our school population is growing like crazy. Now, how do you operate? You're, you're here, the, the breakfast is the greatest thing to kick off, and, and I know that's, that kickoff is the key word there because your work really begins from there, looking ahead Correct. to that. Or Correct. actually, you're in the middle of that work because you've already come up with the agenda. Correct. And so, so then you come in with the General Assembly. So what's, what, how, do you, how do you work? Well, we have a 40-member board that represents a broad spectrum of Montgomery County residents, including businesses and labor unions, nonprofits, civic mm -hmm. associations. And how we operate is we look at legislation that's beneficial to the county, and 85% of that disparate board has to agree on what we're going to support. Wow. Super and while, majority. Yes. And while super, that would super, seem... Super, super majority. Super, yeah. And while that would seem difficult to do, it's surprising at how, much, how many times we actually do get agreement. Okay. Your issues, and I want you know, everybody to, to, to pitch in here, or, okay, but what is the number one priority for Committee for Montgomery? I think uh, it's going after that school construction money. Okay. It's that, and there's two others. One is there's a, a bill in um, for a geographic cost of living adjustment. What, what's that? Well, that what that would mean is there would be a formula by which uh, areas of the state that had higher cost of living would get a, a, a bump in the amount of school funding they got. Okay. And then the other one is uh, bills around the nighttime economy, encouraging the nighttime economy in Montgomery County, and those are specific local bills. Exactly. <laughs> nighttime economy. Exactly. Oh. Is that that's for our family and my wife and I? That's like up to ten o'clock at night. Well, that's what it seems <laughs> to be in Montgomery about. County. But <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, if we want to if we want to ex expand uh, um, the workforce, make sure that the workforce of the future lives in Montgomery County, we're going to have to take a look at how we serve them. So over at Wheaton High School, where I've been working, they. Uh, We've got the new uh, the new Wheaton High Schools under construction. They've torn down the stadium and doing that. How many other like Montgomery County schools are being either built right now or scheduled in the near term? Because if we're asking for seven hundred and fifty million dollars, that sounds like we've got a lot of schools being done. Is it new or is it rebuild? A lot or? of that money is renovation money and mm -hmm. expansion money. 
Um, and, and it's really necessary because of the expansion of population. We're picking up two to three thousand additional kids every year. That's a, that's a high school basically every single yes. year. Oh, uh, the, yeah. the Wheaton High School is at twelve hundred, so it could be you know it's yeah. a new high school well, and uh, all the su supporting. That. So where are some places that that's happening that that need this funding right now? Well, it's happening all over the county. The renovation part in particular is happening all over the county because there's so many older schools. And then you have the whole expansion of the up county, where those buildings don't even exist yet. For and example, think, like well, no, we, we all, but also we've gotten into the situation where the the infill back into the lower county as well, where the school system has gotten rid of or or you know of, of different facilities being used. I know the renovation that goes then when they have to reclaim those facilities is Correct. very expensive as well. Correct. What a challenge to, to, to explain all this. I'm sorry, Stuart. You, you said that last year this county helped other counties mm -hmm. in the state get money. Um, there was no quid pro quo? We're not expecting them to help us now? Well, unfortunately, the way the General Assembly works is um, people think that they've made those alliances, and sometimes they haven't. Last year, we were very instrumental in helping Baltimore City get a significant amount of that money, and mm -hmm. we're really hoping that they'll help us this year. Are they also looking for more money this year? Of course. Of course. <laughs> Well, the, the, the numbers don't lie. I mean, we, on a previous show, we talked about the study from George Mason University. We're looking at, you know, three, four hundred new jobs created over the next ten years every single month in Montgomery County. Month. And we multiply that by two, three people per job. You know, you're, you're looking at that size number of coming in, and that's going to be expanding greatly for the next ten years. We've got about 20 seconds left. Final words, committee from Montgomery optimism in this session. We've got an election coming up as well at the end of this year. What's what's happening? Well, I think the wonderful thing about Committee for Montgomery is the broad spectrum that it represents, and I would just encourage folks to sort of watch what we do. You're welcome to come to our meetings, um, okay. and we'd love to have more participation. Great. Well, I, I may take you up on that, actually, Thanks. Robert. Thank you. Xu Ping. Yes, Don. You know, as I was doing that intro, I, I just kept thinking in the back of my head, kumbaya. Kumbaya, <laughs> yes. Well, we want to make a better world by linking up the businesses and the technologies here in Montgomery County, Maryland, the United States, with the rest of the world. And U.S. Asia Links was a, was a, did, did support the uh, Committee for Montgomery Breakfast uh, earlier in uh, 2013, so we're happy to be partners with com the committee. Uh, the well, who are you? I mean, what's it, what's it comprised of here on this side of the sure. of the Pacific, and and then on the other side? Well, it's uh, five people founded a company. Uh, between the five of us, I think we have maybe over a century worth of uh, experience in uh, international banking, business, law, IT, mm -hmm. hospitality, financial uh, advisory area. So, uh, with our contacts uh, here in Maryland and Montgomery County, and also overseas and developing new and more contacts uh, within the United States and Arkansas, California. We're looking to bring technologies, really, a lot of good, genuine, homemade American technology uh, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is going to be in the green e energy area, in the biofuels area, so that you can bring to a country like China. You can bring mm -hmm. to a country like Vietnam, where th still the majority of the energy is from pieces of coal that pollutes you know, mm -hmm. uh, okay. ex, ex, uh, it just creates a lot of pollution. So that we can bring the green technology there and perhaps uh, reduce the amount of uh, carbon uh, footage, footprints uh, usage uh, in those parts of the world. Now, links seems to me indicates two ways. So you want to be technology, especially green areas, exactly. green going going to Asia yes. around and internationally. What about from Asia here? Oh, we are hosting a delegate. We just hosted a delegation from Tai'an uh, City, which is in northwest uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, China. Uh, they are looking to bring some technology here to build a cancer center, so and also to develop uh, exchanges, educational exchanges, so they can send uh, students, nursing students, you know, uh, people in the uh, medical field. Uh, to study at the University of Maryland, universities at Shady Grove, mm -hmm. and then bring their talents for the education back to that, uh, back to China, so that there'll be, you know, the best type of diplomacy is cultural diplomacy. The best type of diplomacy is uh, economic diplomacy. Mm -hmm. You so refer to this as a business, but it's a non-profit business. No, it is a for-profit. It's okay. a limited liability company. It's a for-profit. So, so how does it charge? What is the Oh well, from? each 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 project is going to be a little bit different in terms of the size, the scope, and the amount of work that we do. Uh, right now, we're working you know, purely on a commission basis, looking for uh, business partners. Uh, there's a lot of funding in China. There's a lot of uh, extra cash lying around that uh, that they want to invest in the United States. So, uh, looking for buyers, you know, any big gigantic develop uh, real estate development. That's we're also into that as well. You've talked a lot about China. 
It's, uh, are you focusing solely on China, or does Asia have a bit, bigger definition in your company? Oh, no. It, it, we, uh, uh, our business partners are from China and Vietnam. We have a business partner from Turkey, actually, and uh, who has a lot of extensive uh, international banking experience, we used to work for the World Bank. And through that, we have uh, outreach uh, to uh, different uh, countries in that part of the world. Uh, we just met recently with uh, someone who just left one of the largest uh, public relations firms in the United States. He went to work for a company in Virginia, and that was hired by the uh, now the president of uh, uh, former uh, Soviet Union you know, state from the former Soviet Union. He won the presidency, so we have a lot of connections there. They need to build the infrastructure again, green technology to make sure. So, what would uh, be an example of like uh, like a typical project that might be pushing? a product from the U.S. over to Asia mm -hmm. that might then therefore bring money back this way. Because we, you know, we always kind of worry about that trade deficit yes. is so much in favor of, of China right now. Like this sounds like an opportunity to bring some of that money coming back. Exactly. What, what would be typical? Well, one, t one, one, one project would be a company, I think it's based in the Midwest in Arkansas. They have uh, a machine that's the size of about a home si or a basement freezer. So not too large, you know, about, about a refrigerator freezer. And that machine, it's actually installed right now in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. That uh, can clean up all of the wastewater, that mm -hmm. little relatively small machine can clean up the, all of the wastewater in the hotel and then get uh, get clean water. So they need to, you know, <coughs> make sure that they get the glitches out of that, the technology out of that. So that, uh, think about that if you, you know, go to a city in, in Asia, anywhere else actually, and you have a freestanding hotel where maybe there's no, the water, uh, the sewage is not that uh, efficient, and then you have basically a freestanding so uh, like water, water purification plant right in right. the hotel. or. Apartment building, what have you. Sounds to me like the cruise lines could. Oh, the cruise lines could <laughs> use that as well, exactly. Yeah. We've got about a minute left. What's, uh, tell me a little bit about how the economic picture looks. I right think now. it looks very, very bright. I think, uh, especially uh, if you, you know, China's a gigantic, already well developed market. Getting in there is very bureaucratic and very mm -hmm. difficult. But I think a country like Vietnam, with, I think, the vast majority of its population is under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the opportunities there are just uh, endless, I think. And then uh, we're looking to. Uh, Isn't this just an opportunity, Xu Ping, for you to be able to travel the world? Oh, why not? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And when, when we do get the corporate jet done, you'll be one of our first guests. <laughs> we're ready. <laughs> what's, um, uh, what's your next delegation coming in, real quick? Uh, from Taiyan. Another okay. delegation from Taiyan. Actually, the delegation is from the U.S. to Taiyan. Okay. To, to Taiyan, to, so to be part of the medical, medical field. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Don. We'll be right back after these messages. And we're back. Aaron Overton, welcome back. Hey, good to be here. It is great to be able to teach your students game programming where they don't even know yeah. they're learning, do they? No, it, to a certain extent, some of them like forget that there's a big learning process going on. And it came about in a very odd way. Uh, the, you know, I set out to teach web programming this, this last okay. semester, and we've just had a real struggle with getting web servers available. And if you don't have like web servers available in your computer lab, well then, you know, you gotta like come up with something else. So kind of like at the last minute, um, I said, all right, well, let's try, uh, let's try game programming. And so the students and I have actually been learning elements of it together, okay. which is great. Uh, and we've been using a product called Unity, uh, Unity 3D, and so it's a three-dimensional game. Unity sounds energy. a little bit like our last. Yeah. I know it's yeah. like it's so yeah. nice, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. connected, right? Yeah. Um, so Unity 3D is a 3D 3D game engine. Uh, titles like some of the recent Call of Duty games and stuff like that that okay. you know younger people are going to know really well. They've been built in this on this platform. It's, it's growing very fast and makes it very accessible for even young people to get in there and start creating their own games very quickly. Okay. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that many of the lessons that I would teach like in an AP computer programming class about object-oriented programming and Java and things like that, we can go on to uh, the Unity website to their learn area and just there's a bunch of tutorials that have been created and they've actually like supplied um, attractive 3D mm -hmm. models to make it so that you're playing with you know with game elements that look okay. really great already 
and yet they're the same lessons. They're the okay. same lessons that we would teach in the very dry and boring kind of. It like sounds. Compiled. It sounds fun. This sounds like the high school classes I never had. Yeah. <laughs> it's, is, it's is everybody really working fun. on their own games, or are they all working together? Well, so it's game? interesting. What we did is the first semester they were all working kind of independently and learning what parts of it they like because some people want to be a 3D animator, some want to do scripting, some want to do level design and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different roles that go into a, into the way that you build a, uh, a video game. Mm -hmm. So now that they've all had that experience, we are beginning shortly to bring them together so that each of my classes will be two or three game programming teams and they will all set out to basically compete to kind of compete, mm -hmm. I've given them a base structure of a game concept, and now they're going to run with that as a team. Can these become commercially viable? Well, this is, yeah, this is the really interesting part. What I'm going to try to do with these students is that some of them who maybe feel like they're a little struggling with the programming mm -hmm. side of it, but they do still want to be involved in web development, mm -hmm. we're going to have them produce basically a marketing site for the, mm -hmm. for the game system. And if they feel like up to it, we'll go on to uh, Kickstarter and I, try to actually raise money for the. You know, I can't wait. Call of Duty Wheaton. <laughs> and, you know, invading Bethesda, Silver Spring, <laughs> take on Darnstown. This is going to well, be great stuff. I have to admit that uh, I really enjoyed that one of the Fallout games that uh, Bethesda Softworks, that's located right. over in Rockville, did. They they based one of their Fallout game in this area. So like going into the German town police station to fight the super mutants was yes. kind of <laughs> was kind of cool to go. So and do who that. are your students? Are they just the sort of general run of the mill student well, in Wheaton? Wheaton High School has an IT academy, so it's the a Academy mm. of Information Technology. So the majority of my students are actually. Uh, I'm teaching the advanced classes, so they're second, third, or fourth year students. They've got a little bit of programming experience, and now they're coming in to be able to to kind of uh, work in that environment, go and do more. And so, and what so, do they see as the future for themselves? Uh, many of them want to be programmers. Uh, and some of them like they're taking this because it was interesting, but they don't necessarily think that that's going to be the mm -hmm. direction that they want to go. I mean, I have. I have a student who'd really like to be a police officer, and you know, so I. So the college, yeah. so the mutants in Germany. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, can, yeah. so it's, it's a like vocational program, or it's no, it, this is part of the. This is just you know the the uh, Down County Consortium mm -hmm. allows like has different academies through all the different mm -hmm. five schools, and Wheaton has the biosciences, and it has the engineering, and it has the IT academy, and we've got one other that I can never seem to remember. <laughs> um, but the IT Academy teaches them about, like is primarily right now, it's web and computer programming. So they, they follow that course of study and it's a portion of their of their regular. We've is, got 30 is, seconds is left. It, is it part of the academics or is it in lieu of the academics? No, it's no. as part of the academics. academics. I mean, they have seven classes a day and they've mm -hmm. got their English and their math okay. and stuff like that. And then they pursue this specialty. So they typically take four or five classes during the course of mm -hmm. their their high school year to focus. Can these kids make it without going to college? Uh, yes, they absolutely could. How Which, so? Uh, well, because this is a the, the computer programming field is one that there are lots of people mm -hmm. very successful because they started as a teenager mm -hmm. and now they're making mm -hmm. you know six figure salaries and they skip the whole college experience altogether. Wow. So it's a great way to get them started. You're glad you're you're, you're satisfied with what you're doing. I love what I'm doing. That's yeah. Great, Aaron. Thanks. We look yeah. forward to having you back. Okay, I'll do it. Stuart, done. What a great segue! We go it from is. these Perfect. high school kids going. Now we have the folks on the other end of their life spectrum mm -hmm. uh, able to access the Beacon mobile app. Tell That's us about right, it. Right. Well, you know, most of our readers really do prefer to read in print, and I actually start my column this month with a uh, discussion of the new Scientific American article that came out a, a month or so ago called "Why the Brain Prefers Print," mm -hmm. and they evaluated 20 years worth of studies in the subject area of uh, online and screen work versus print. And they discovered that you, you comprehend better when you read in print, you recall better, and you have less eye strain, fewer headaches. Um, it's just a general a better experience and a more effective one. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why most boomers and older adults that I meet you know, all prefer to read in print rather but, than on screen. But not as good an experience for the forest or the paper. The trees well, that's that's one okay. way to look at it. Yeah. But there are other benefits to being able to read right. on a screen or carry right. your iPad around or look convenience. On your, your smartphone. Absolutely. Um, so there, we wanted to be part of the up and coming revolution in that sense, and so the Beacon has now finally unveiled its first mobile app. 
So you can download from Rock the Apple Star. Apple yeah. iStore App Store or okay. from the Google Play Store, and it uh, takes our website basically and right. reformats it in a way that's much more conducive to reading on a tablet or a so phone. So I just I just hit my iPhone, hit the app, and pop. There's there's, there's the whole list. Of well, the you store. can go to the to the store. It's free. You can download the app, right. and then when What's you when you app use the app, it's download. Yeah, app. yeah. Then, then, then to access the beacon, you just open it up, and it it starts out showing you sort of the selection of stories. Mm -hmm. But then at the bottom there are there are buttons and you can say I want to see the paper as it looks in print and then you'll get a flip mm -hmm. version of the of the actual newspaper. Or you can say I want to see the videos or I want to see the games or I want to see the comics or mm -hmm. whatever else that you want to see. If I forgot there was an article five months ago but I can't remember when I just right, search. Right, you can look at the pack. So have you uh, have you investigated the opportunity of bringing it to the Kindle? Device or other kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, I believe readers. it's. Yeah. I believe so it's already. Because that's that. one of the things. Is a sci this Scientific American article is still getting at twenty years, but the the thing is, is some of the new technology that's been coming out for readers, like the like uh, Kindle's been really, uh, Amazon's been really touting their Kindle Paperwhite, mm -hmm. and they talk about the digital ink and the higher resolution retina screens that have like mm -hmm. higher dots per inch are supposed right. to like start resolving some of the eye strain mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I personally love like the Kindle Paperwhite thing that I have that I can slip in my back pocket and it's very light and mm -hmm. I'm interested in the behind the scenes issues that you may have addressed uh, with your staff. I uh, mean, w was there a transition because you know when you write for the screen as opposed to writing in print, it's it's sort of a different animal. Well, we haven't really done that. We we like I think our readers like our format of our publication and our stories and their lengths and whatnot. So it's not like we've turned the whole experience mm -hmm. into a you know, short snippets and blogs hour. and that kind of thing. And I'll, yes, it's not that. It's really, it's the same. We do load things up almost every day, but not as in to mm -hmm. the degree that you know some of these daily sites would do. Mm -hmm. We're not Hu Huffington Post. We are basically just <laughs> a formatting version right now. But this is early. I mean, we don't expect this to be yeah, a major percentage of our readers. Are but are down you the road, at maybe web-only content that might be shorter. Well, like, we have you know, we have web. We do. I mean, on our website, we are able to put up more stories than we can put in our paper because our paper's limited in size. So as I say, we do always add additional things to the website, and we have a calendar of events on the website which we don't have, I mean, we have beacon bits in the paper, right. but we don't have an ongoing update beacon calendar. Beacon bits, I like that. Beacon We've bits. had that don't for call like us 25 beacon years. Bits. No, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I want to put that on there. We're, We're kosher, there. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kosher. Yes. What other kosher things are we talking about? What's the, tell us about some uh, of the health, health I mean, We have some really event. phenomenal yeah, yeah. health stories this month. Okay, in we, the we don't have a lot of time, but and All right, well, let me just sort of, I'll touch on them quickly. One is gene therapy. There have been a number of study, uh, recent developments, uh, 120 or so uh, cases of individuals who have gotten with leukemia, who have run out of all other options, who have been able to get any kind of help with anything else, with this one gene therapy, a one dose ad adjustment to their white blood cells, have had complete remission. Mm -hmm. 19 of 22 children and five adults, all amazing. complete remission. Amen. In one, well, you know, it's amazing. Wow. So this has the potential to be the first real gene therapy in America that works, and will be the first therapy for cancer in the world. Okay. Another story is about a robotic arm which was developed by students in the uh, University of Pennsylvania. They were engineering students in college mm -hmm. and they came up with this project where they developed uh, a robotic arm that can be used, for example, by grandparents to lift their grandparents. So I have my arm, and right. is it like an exoskeleton yes, kind Yes, it's of an thing? exoskeleton around the arm oh, with cables, that. That, and I it has a, it and I a little joystick <laughs> which helps you move it, and then you wear a small backpack which is a battery powered so you can move around with it. They spent $2,000, and they developed this thing which, which works for you know, all people who are working on, on uh, sure. lines where they have to always, you know, construction, exactly. So that has potential tremendously to be very successful. 40 seconds. And then a wheelchair Perfect. article. People okay. who are paralyzed from the neck down who are right. unable to move the wheelchair, how do they get around? There have been these straws where you right. blow and pull and stuff. Now there's a new development. They have a stud in your tongue. Okay. And you wear a, a headset, and, and by moving your tongue, touching it to your right or left teeth, you move this wheelchair. And it's much, apparently much easier. It's much less strain. It's much faster. They learn it more quickly. Now, people who don't want to have their tongue t uh, pierced, you know, don't want to do it. Who doesn't want their tongue pierced? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't right. doesn't yeah. everyone here have their tongue pierced? <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so all kinds of amazing technology. things happening in the world. I it's think it's so in, exciting. And it's all in the beacon. All in the beacon. Everyone. Right. Thank you, Stuart. And thanks, all of you. What a great show. And thank all of you and the viewing audience for joining us for this week's edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moores. I welcome you to come back again next week at this very same time. Thank you.